Hello, hot goslings. Uh, hi, hi. So happy to be here. And greetings, goslings. Uh, hoping that Sexual Assault Awareness Month is going well for everybody. It is so busy for us. We're so tired. Yeah, so April is historically an exceptionally busy month here for us to speak about it with various programs trying to both boost sexual health and decrease sexual assault by talking about the importance of consent and comprehensive sex education. Yes, and comprehensive sex ed is like absolutely crucial just in getting healthier outcomes for young people. Uh, but what does that mean? What is comprehensive sex ed? Um, and so like, I also noticed that there's a third person here today, Abby, and I know who you are and I know why this conversation is important, but we should maybe like make sure the people know. So Abby, who are you? <laughs> yes, hi, um, as Aranda said, my name's Abby. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an educator with Speak About It, slash generally fit into this conversation as someone who is likely to be very loudly talking about the importance of comprehensive sex and relationship education, both professionally and just personally. I care a lot. So <laughs> happy to be here. Which is honestly one of our favorite things about you. <laughs> so that is, yeah. Yeah. So we like actively love it. We're pumped about this conversation. Um, and we always like to make it really clear that comprehensive sex ed is like a combination of giving facts, but also like really clear discussions of um, what the available options are and I guess like the social context that somebody exists in. And that's like my fancy way of saying that it's like really important for families and support networks to be able to share bits of their cultural information, right? To the person that's receiving the comprehensive sex ed. So that way that person receiving the information can figure out the larger context of how do I want this to play out in my life, right? Like how does this affect me as a person, as a whole person, right? And so kind of central to that process is really people being, I guess like empowered to make informed decisions about their lives and the things that they want and need in those lives. Yeah, exactly that. So starting the process of teaching those skills young and being able to continue to foster those skills through one's life is so important to making independent, responsible, and compassionate people in relationships both like with themselves and with their partners. Um, and we couldn't help but notice uh, that there are a few policies across the country that have recently gone into effect or are about to go into effect that may very well challenge that. Um, want to make it clear that we are not saying that you should believe or support one side of this issue um, or the other, but we did want to make space to introduce some of those policies and to share why we feel strongly about keeping that dialogue open. So uh, buckle up, because <laughs> I am going to try my best to give you all a bunch of the background information. And don't worry, we can share links to articles so you can read up for yourself. Um, so number one, Oklahoma has recently been in the news for following in Texas's footsteps to build up laws that will make it incredibly difficult for pregnant people to have access to abortion. So patients typically go to the doctor around seven to eight weeks into a pregnancy, but according to Texas law, they must do that at about five weeks, which might seem like a lot of time, but is frankly, frankly way too early for many ultrasounds to detect pregnancy or for an individual to even notice that something might be off in their cycle. Um, that creates a roughly two to three week window that just isn't feasible for every person to detect pregnancy, get an appointment, think about their options, and then to get an abortion. Um, and so this is causing a dangerous lack of information and creates a need for many people to look for alternative options that might be uh, unideal for a number of reasons and in a number of ways. Um, number two, <laughs> Florida Senate famously passed the Don't Say Gay Bill in March of this year after pig piggybacking on the targeting of critical race theory in schools. Um, moves were made to eliminate any lessons or discussion on sexual orientation in kindergarten through third grade and other grades unless they are quote unquote age appropriate and developmentally appropriate. Um, in theory, that might seem fine, but in practice is really tricky as development is so different based across independent children's needs and everybody's idea of age appropriate is really, really different. So it's hard to, you know, to keep track of. Um, also, the bill has mainly been used to target telling about the alternative family structures that include many queer parents, um, even in teachings as simple as like books during story time. And those are being targeted as being inappropriate since it teaches about sexual orientation while completely ignoring the fact that teaching about a heteronormative husband and wife relationship also teaches about sexual orientation in the same exact way. So. Um, 
Ohio has recently been following suit, going further than that by banning divisive topics altogether in classrooms and workplaces. Um, again, this is technically not a bad thing on paper, except for the fact that the lack of understanding frequently leads to fear and hate, as our country's history has shown time and time again. <laughs> um, and people that possess marginalized identities will likely no longer benefit from uh, diversity trainings, HR policies that protect them, or just like being able to discuss the ways that they are being hurt in their communities in a significant way. Um, in addition, legislators have proposed about 325 bills so far that challenge LGBTQ rights, wow. and about 130 of those specifically target transgender rights. Um, let's not forget <laughs> that the 268 anti-LGBTQ bills, um, 27 of which became laws in 2021, um, a pretty stark um, fact that I was made aware of recently is that the Human Rights Campaign lists 2021 as being the worst year in recent history for anti-LGBTQ legislation. So that is a lot. <laughs> yeah, but, yes. like that's, it's so funny, like not funny, um, but it's so interesting that like the rule of threes, you always want to give things in a list of three, and that's like the saddest rule of threes I've ever heard. It's, it's not like a list of billions. Yeah, yeah it's a lot. Um, I guess we're, that's a lot of content that you just mentioned. And so I guess because we're educators, it's like maybe like focused on some of the like school and education related stuff. And so I guess thinking about why is it critical to allow schools to feel comfortable discussing queer inclusive sex ed, right? So the CDC recently came out with some data suggesting that LGBTQ plus students may be up to 140% more likely to miss school for fear of violence. And going to say that again, 140% more likely that a queer student is going to miss school for fear of violence um, than a like just a straight student. Schools with support groups like a gay straight alliance, they tend to have fewer threats of violence towards queer students. So when there is like some sort of like public and obvious forward-facing attempt at like equity and at inclusion, that actually really helps to lower those threats of violence. So that's really important to know. Um, and that means that queer students were less likely to miss school for feeling unsafe. And the study kind of went on to say, in schools that have policies prohibiting homophobic expressions and a gay straight alliance for, I think, at least three years, they found that suicidal thoughts and attempts are lower amongst queer students, right? And so this idea sometimes that, um, that just because every kid is bullied, they'll like figure it out and get past it. They might not, right? <laughs> and that like, like knowing that you were in a place that supports you and like provides space for you, is really critically important. And so for any institution trying to think, what can we do for our like youths to not be depressed and not attempt these, um, any number of unhelpful or like harmful personal actions, it's support them, right? Acknowledge that their identities might exist and give them like real information. Um, research also shows that about 50% of young queer students have at least one very close online friend um, compared to about 19% of just like non-queer identified students. Um, and that's, kind of like the idea behind that is that they think that because the internet is such a vast place and they can find validation and community anywhere, that that's the place that they have to kind of like look and find like a stranger across the world or across the country to like find someone to connect with. Whereas queer student or non-queer students can kind of just like look around the school, you know, and can find safety and find uh, companionship there. Um, we also know that the internet is like not always the safest place for young folks. And so finding ways for them to feel like they have a safe space offline is really critical. Um, and we also don't want folks to conflate providing a safer environment for young queer folks with encouraging people to like turn queer, right? And so there's been a recent Gallup poll showing that statistically more folks in Gen Z, kind of as you go like down in age from boomers to like now, um, more people statistically identify as being queer. And research is suggesting that it's not because more people are actively like turning queer, that it's more people feel comfortable and safe admitting, right, and like feel safe like kind of taking part in this community as they're seeing that things can look really different. Um, that was a lot of stuff. Abby, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to pull kind of on that thread of what is going on online and the way that our online interactions might be potentially impacting like some of the ways that information is being shared. Um, there are a huge amount of sex educators and gender educators who are doing work on social media platforms. And we will try to link some of them below. So if you're curious about looking at some of the people that I personally learn a lot from, um, you can find them there. 
there's something really beautiful about people who've had lived experiences, like actively taking their time to build careers and content about um, identities that they have that have been marginalized in the past. It can be a huge beacon for young people to be able to kind of see and gives all of us access to a little bit more information about a variety of different um, humans and their own life experiences and identities. But there's kind of a double-edged sword side to that as well, because it also means that there's like homophobia and a lot of hate that is rampant on a lot of these creators' pages online. And that's something that they constantly have to deal with. Again, I just want to reiterate, no one is trying to turn anybody gay. Um, the whole point is that we don't have control over anyone's sexuality and we should be allowing people and encouraging them to like discover the full expression of their sexual orientation, their gender identity, like the full expression of their humanity. That's the goal always mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I guess I also want to point out that like, pro I'm jumping right back in. <laughs> Prohibition like doesn't erase a behavior, right? Or like doesn't like destroy an identity it just makes it go underground, right? It just like forces it into the shadows and that can help to increase like bigotry and like just like internal conflict and violence and like the demonization of like otherwise perfectly natural feelings, right? And so it's like, look at like alcohol prohibition, like drinking didn't stop. It just literally happened underground. Um, and like none of those things are conducive to living healthy, happy, proud lives or to having like cohesive supportive communities. So it's like wanting to be like really aware of that. Yeah. I mean, at this point, Speak About It has worked with over half a million students in the past decade. Um, we've done work internationally and across the country, so our communities are diverse and they are widespread. Um, I'd really love to tap into how we have seen silence around these important conversations. How does that affect the students that we work with? Um, I'm curious to know if any of you have any stories that stand out to you from working with students directly. Yeah, um, I have so many, I have so many stories. <laughs> um, so I'm always really struck by this memory of, um, we went to a school where like sexuality was frowned upon um, in a number of ways, both like in policy and kind of just like generally in practice by the admin. Um, and we're having a really tough time getting students to talk to us at first. And one of my favorite questions is like, hey, where's this silence coming from? Like, why does this seem so uncomfortable? And immediately several people were like, we can't talk honesty with admin here. Like we don't feel like comfortable or safe expressing our like thoughts and feelings around them. Um, Cause we're, and like, we're worried about gossip and slut shaming. And as we like unpack the gossip and slut shaming thing, I was really like shaken to hear that like, it wasn't like from their peers, it was from the adults. So they were like actively worried about being slut shamed and uh, gossiped about by. And it was interesting. Cause like, I don't think that the adults really realized that like their jokes, their like little discussions that like little, references to other people's uh, behavior, like, pro like prohibiting like certain pieces of like perfectly natural life was really making kids feel isolated and feeling like their only way to really engage in like either learning about or exploring their feelings and their sexuality was to hide it from like the adult view and then ultimately engage in what they even were acknowledging were risky behaviors. And like the term that someone used that we still use is efficiency sex, which basically is just like cool, like, where can we go to, like, bang this out real quick, right? So, like, behind this bleacher, or, like, in this, like, broom closet, just, like, anywhere to do it. Um, and the few admin that were there then offered to kind of, like, leave, and, like, um, as long as, like, the students were okay with us giving a summary at the end of, like, the information. And it was just, like, a dam had burst. <laughs> like, they had so much to say after that point. And fundamentally, they just wanted a safe space where no one was going to judge them for asking questions. And they're like, we want to make good decisions. We just know that we cannot do that without like honest conversation. And we want adults that are like able to like talk to us, um, which and like that. That's like it, that, I will never forget that school those like moments. Yeah, absolutely. I think I have several stories that are similar to that as well, but in the interest in kind of bringing it back to some of what we're talking about today, um, I have two experiences that come to mind, specifically speaking to young trans students after shows. Um, one was a trans man of color who came up to me and some other educators after we did the show, who normally like to like hang out and take questions if there's anything anyone has. Um, and he essentially came up to us and was like, hey, this is a really small campus and I'm the only person who's on this campus who has all of these various intersecting identities. Mm -hmm. um, like I'm the only trans man of color that's here. How do I find community? Like, how do I look for and find that? Um, and I had another experience where normally when we do post-show discussions, we all share our names and pronouns. Um, and there was a student in the room who shared her name, shared her pronouns, and then said the statement, I feel very aware of my body right now. 
mm. which just felt like something that um, for I just like I'm really grateful for the work that Speak About It does and for being able to be someone and be an organization that can come in and be a trusted resource for students who might feel like they're not receiving necessarily the same level of openness from their home administrations. But it also strikes me that it's really important both to find queer community that can bond over those shared identity characteristics that you can learn from, that you can potentially like model aspects of your behavior off of if you're still kind of trying to figure out who you are, but it's as equally important for us to be able to integrate queer students into a larger community, right? Because like speak about it visits for a day. And so we have to also find ways for those students who might be feeling a little bit more isolated because of various identity factors to still be a part of the whole, right? Like how does that work together? Um, I know that we all know this in this conversation, but I just wanted to bring up those stories to remind that like at the heart of these issues um, that people are making laws about and things like that is frequently like young people who are feeling alone and mm -hmm. just want to find some sort of community. Yeah. All right, that's great. So we know that discussing new topics or ones that we don't maybe have very much experience on can feel pretty scary and it can feel daunting. So I think that we wanna discuss like, how do you deal with those feelings to have more productive and inclusive conversations, even though they might be kind of tricky. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I am going to tell another story and I'll try to make this one faster. Um, the kind of abridged version is we went to one of the like many military kind of academies um, around the country. There was a very curious um, student from like the deep south that wanted to talk about pronouns and like transgender identity specifically and like the abridged version, he just didn't get it, right? And he was like, I was born a man, so I'm a man. Everyone I know was like born X thing and they are that thing. Like this like in between or like changing partway through doesn't make sense. And he like found that he would like occasionally go online and try to get information. And like when he asked a question, like people would kind of like jump on him for like not educating himself and for like not getting it. And he eventually got like really frustrated. He's like, I don't have time, right? Like I'm trying to like cram four years of school in two and a half years because then I've got to like go and like serve in the forces. And just like, I just, I'm trying not to like die out there doing this. Like I can't learn all of this stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. Then like, then be done, right? <laughs> and he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, like you sat through an hour long show, an hour long post-show discussion, and then sought us out. Now we've had another hour long discussion. That's three hours out of your day you've dedicated to this. I think you're good for today, right? Like, just like, take a second. Um, and he's like, that doesn't make me a bad person. And I was like, no, right? But like, like you can't, you can only do so much as one human being. Like you, again, the whole point of this is celebrating the wholeness of a human. And that was really huge for him. And so I guess my thought, like, what, like, why does this story come up in my head? Is that it's really important to remember that it's okay if you're overwhelmed by like trying to understand a whole new point of view, a whole person's experience. And it's not okay to like never make an attempt to connect or never make an attempt to like try to understand. But if you can only do it in like bite-sized chunks here and there, that's fine. Cause you are a full person with your own life and your own baggage and all those other things. And like, that's okay if you need to like break it up into like smaller pieces, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll add like practice makes perfect. Like sometimes when things are really hard, just trying or practicing one skill can be really useful. Before working with Speak About It, I was a preschool teacher for a long time and we had lots of discussions with like really, really young kiddos about things that would potentially be considered sex education. Things like how to respect when people tell you a different name to call them or different pronouns to call them and um, how to set and respect boundaries so both for yourself and other people this is a lot of the like when you're talking with little littles the like hey keep your hands to yourself like ask if you want to hug um mm -hmm. just being able to model those choices for them and being able to model for them as well like hey miss abby actually said she doesn't want to hug today so so that they can see from like a young age what it feels like to set a boundary so that's something that you can start practicing really early we also can affirm curiosity um both with arane the student you talked about and with young people who might be just really curious about like why all of a sudden we're not talking about specific things in school or people seem to be really caught up on X, Y, Z and just learning how to ask questions in a respectful way. Like these are skills that go so far and are applicable to people from like literally the age of two till like nineties and beyond, right? Just like, how do you understand yourself set your own boundary and then respectfully communicate across differences, especially if there's something you don't understand. So I think sometimes we get caught up in making it complicated, but it can be a little 
easier than we might think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's also like kind of important to remember that like the media already includes like a lot of non-traditional family structures and like acknowledging the existence of something does not mean that you necessarily have to dig into the specifics of that thing like right then and there. Like maybe this is kind of like a funny example, but like Finding Nemo like features the loss of one parent and the trauma that the family faces as, as they like have to find like a new chosen family. And one could argue that like the death and restructuring of a family could be too intense for a child, right? But it's really all about what is right for your family and how you structure the conversation. It's not like inherently bad to acknowledge that a situation exists, but that you'll like talk about it later when you and your child are ready to do that. Um, just like Disney movies virtually all include like a couple that lives happily ever after um, and has children, but it doesn't mean that you have to like describe the graphic details of like the sex that it takes to get there. Um, curricula can acknowledge that queer people exist and deserve respect without going into like too many details. Um, this all makes me wonder why society often views the mere mention of queerness as being too extreme or explicit or like never really um, removed from sex. I think the first thing that pops into my mind is that like we kind of fundamentally fear the unknown, right? And so it's like why death is scary or why like humans have a fear of the dark. Um, and if most people are straight or at least are like performing straightness, right, then anything else isn't really seen or known. And so then it becomes scary, right? And it looks like, again, that's where like representation becomes really important to be able to say, oh, I'm not alone in this experience or alone in this identity. If you don't have any good models of what something looks like, then it's really hard for you to like do said thing. And media is still incredibly limiting even in the representations that we get of queerness. Like the number of times I've heard even like adult people say like, oh, I didn't realize I could be queer because like, I don't like show tunes because I, I don't like dress in like things from like the other gender that it's like people just like have such a limited understanding. So I think that's like, I think that's like a big piece of it. Um, I also think that there's like a way in which religion kind of like, people say that religion frowns on it, but for some practitioners, like even within their own religion, like it's a matter of interpretation, you know, and I will not get too deep into that, but a lot of thoughts, that's like a different hot guts. Um, but that does kind of like transition me into the idea that like, there's some folks that say biologically queerness like doesn't make sense, right? That like for queerness to exist, um, that it like kind of like prevents the species from moving forward. But one could also argue that like queerness does exist in like the animal world all the time. It exists across species and it's been a part of our human race for a very long time. There's actually some really interesting psychology that's coming out recently about psychologically we maybe need queer people. And um, again, different hot goss, but I will <laughs> tell people more about that one. Um, and then lastly, I think that there's like kind of like a big thing about stereotypes kind of like looped back to the first thing about like there's a stereotype about like gay men being like extra sexual, right? Being hypersexualized. So like people imagine like pride parades with like half naked dudes and fetish wear and like maybe participating in public sex. And like, yes, that does technically exist in some places, but that's not everyone's experience. And furthermore, people are ignoring like important historical context where after decades of repressed sexual desire, like going to a gay bar and like having to, again, it's efficiency sex, right? Like exploring like in a bathroom with someone or behind the bar it's the only time you get to express who you are and what you're doing and so like for them it wasn't necessarily ideal but it was the only time they could be themselves right and so and like that historical moment got kind of stripped of context and got plastered around as being like the over overarching experience which is not fair yeah absolutely and i think um you saying that reminds me also of the way that we think sometimes about gay women and two women being in a sexual romantic relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. um, there's a stereotype that when that's happening, it's like, quote, hot, or like only for the enjoyment of men. Um, and that's just totally like textbook intersection of both homophobia and patriarchy. Like the male gaze has totally impacted the way that we see women in relationship with one another, even if like in reality, the sexual charge of whatever relationship depends only on the participants within it and not on like what people think about it looking from the mm -hmm. outside. So there's this bell hooks quote um, that's been circulating on the gay internet for a while <laughs> that I wanted to read out as well um, because I think it also kind of speaks to a dimension of this fear and the stereotyping. Um, it is Queer as not about who you're having sex with, that can be a dimension of it, but queer as being about the self that is at odds with everything around it and has to invent and create and find a place to speak and to thrive and to live. 
there are these specific myths and stereotypes and misunderstandings of history and context that fuel all of these misconceptions of queer folks. But I also think that this idea of someone disrupting the status quo when the status quo is something that is like shoved at all of us so aggressively from the time that we are really, really young can feel really threatening. Mm -hmm. If you are someone who is particularly activated by discussions around talking about LGBTQ inclusive education, especially for youth, I invite you to think about the ways in which you might hold beliefs that actually limit you um, and how those might interact with this topic and the way that you feel about queer folks as you see them kind of living outside of those particular limiting beliefs, like what that brings up and what that signifies. First of all, I love that quote. And I think that was like a really beautiful way to kind of like lead us into the end of this episode. Um, obviously today we have touched on a lot of different talking points that frankly could have all been their own episode of Hot Goss, but it felt really important to address them in this way since it is such a pressing issue right now specifically. And I think calling our attention to them like kind of like in mass um, is just something that especially right now, it's important for us to do. Um, but that being said, what are our takeaways mm -hmm. from this, Arunde, Abby? What is like a last little nugget that you would like to leave us with? I love takeaways. And so my like first thing is I think it's really important to remember that like, it's okay to not understand something and it's okay to take it in like bite-sized chunks, right? To like make small individual pieces um, that I think that we, it's okay to be overwhelmed by a topic, but to like just pretend it doesn't exist isn't helpful. So that's my first thing. And then my second thing is, um, Abby, you said something that like sparked my mind that was really interesting about like encouraging curiosity. And I think that people think that they are being curious when they're asking some questions that are like invasively personal, right? And so it's okay to ask like, oh, why might a person use a pronoun other than like what they were born as? but it's not as helpful to be like, hey, you, what is your relationship to your gender? What's between your legs, right? Like those are two <laughs> different things. And so I think like being like really aware of like, am I asking something that's like unfairly personal or am I asking about a concept, right? And like that curiosity about concepts, 100% all day, every day. The curiosity of like someone's personal intimate life, they do not owe you details. And so like that maybe is like less fair. Yeah, that also segues around a perfectly into the takeaway that I was going to share. Oh. <laughs> um, which is that in this moment where it feels like there is there is government restriction on specific access to resources, just to remind you to like, there are people who are actively doing the work to share about these experiences and try to build those connections. So like I said before, we're going to link some people, um, hopefully that you all can like check. I don't know if it'll be in the bio, Mackenzie, or if it'll be Yes. In the caption. Okay, You're great. Be yeah. <laughs> so somewhere on the Instagram, there will be links of some people that you can follow who are actively like trying to teach and educate. And remember that there are also so many other like books, accounts, podcasts, organizations like Speak About It that are doing this work so that you don't have to like harass people again to tell them about things that actively impact them. So just a reminder to look for your resources and know where those are and how to find them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I think my takeaway would just be that I think something that comes up a lot in these conversations, um, specifically around like education, is that children are really like impressionable. But I think that really it's that children are like really like empathetic and they have a lot more like capacity for like understanding maybe like um, in not intense, but like complicated um, subjects, like more than we give them credit for. Um, and I think that that is something that is like a strength and not something that should be restricted. Mm -hmm. And yeah. frankly, it's like less complicated for them because like they don't know how the world works yet. And so if you just tell them that, that's <laughs> yeah. how it is, it's harder for us that are like trying to like change our minds. So that's really good. Yeah. yeah. Anywho, thanks, Hot Goslings. <laughs> oh, fun. Thanks for having me here. Yes, thank you for being here, Abby. Um, all right. Bye, Goslings. We'll see you next bye. time. Bye.